Okay, so my name is, um, well, it's up there, Professor Warford. And um, this is Math 220, Formal Methods. This is the math course that is designed for computer science majors and minors. And the, there's some information in here on your syllabus. Uh, the first section here, well, it has my office hours there. You're welcome. I usually, my door's usually open. And if you want to come by and it's not one of these office hours, and chances are I'll be there and my door will be open unless I'm in class, and it's fine. And if you want to make sure I'm there at another time, just check with me after class. We can, you know, arrange to make sure that I'm available for you there. Um, the course web page is also listed here. You probably want to bookmark that on your, on your um, computer. And here it is on the screen. Uh, there's my, if you want to check, uh, get in touch with me via email, you can just click on the link there. And um, there's a bunch of administrative notices here that I don't want to spend time going on classes. It's about the online evaluations and disability notice, academic integrity, blah, 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 blah. There is one thing, though, that I would, that's kind of different here. It's this video recording. So we have two students, actually Ashley is one of them, who um, because of their schedules, they need to take the course, but um, there is a, they, they have conflicts in their schedule. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to videotape each lecture. This is a big experiment. And we're going to um, upload them to iTunes U. Now iTunes U, so this means that all of you guys can actually have access to, to the videos. But they are primarily for these two students who are not able to be here in class, all right? And um, the instructions on how to log into iTunes U and, and get the content is right there. And the, the plan is to have each lecture uh, uploaded by 5 o'clock on the day of the lecture. So tonight after 5, if you want to take a shot at it, you can, you can check it out there. Um, you know, uh, hi. Here you go. So you must be Rochelle, right? Okay. There you go. Thank you. So, um, and I don't know if any of your math classes, if teachers have you like come up to the board and do work, but we won't do that. So you, you will not be video. Now you don't have to worry about being, you know, See, right, right. So I, we, will, we, won't, we won't do that. But on the other hand, I, there is a lot of class participation. I'm sorry? We'll put that on YouTube. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's what. Well, actually, this, the iTunes, you know, there's a public iTunes U, and then there's a Pepperdine that you have to log into. This is not going to the public. This is going to just within Pepperdine. So, you know, if, if you want to access these things, you, you do have to log, you, you do have to, you know, sign in with your Pepperdine ID and password to get to these. So this is not for the outside world yet. <laughs> not to say it won't be in the future. But um, so anyway, that's the notice about the video recording. I hope everyone's OK with that. Um, now, let me say a word about the goal of the course, which is uh, printed on your syllabus here. And by the way, this syllabus is also, you can download it from the website. Um, now here's the thing, I assume that most of you are first starting off in computing. And I want, uh, here is um, our philosophy about how to learn computer science. In all scientific disciplines, there is a theory and a practice. All right? And if, if an academic discipline does not have a theory behind it, then it's really not an academic discipline. It's like a trade, you know. It's, 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 it's like a trade as opposed to an academic discipline. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that the theoretical basis of computer science is mathematics, and in particular, it's logic. It's formal logic. And so the curriculum is designed so that the, the first course, there are two, there's a parallel sequence of courses, one of which is Computer Science 220, and this one is Math 220. And these two divisions represent the distinction between theory, which is this class, versus practice, 
which is the computer science class. So in this class, we're not going to do any programming on the computer. This is going to be all intellectual. All right, this is going to be all in our heads. But we will talk about programming. In fact, we will do some programming problems, but the programming problems that we do will be, will be mathematical derivations of, of programs, you see. And that is, and um, so it's really whatever you do, the important thing is to have a balance between the theory and the practice. So even though this is going to be weighted way to the theory, we understand that it is in conjunction with a body of practice as well. And all throughout the course, you know, as you take later courses, we will always be, uh, we will use the, these theoretical principles to, to, to do proofs and to derive things and to, and to describe uh, how, how programs work. But um, you always just have to be aware that, that, there, that there are these two parts, two aspects to the discipline. And there's always a danger. There's a danger that, that some people, they like doing one part a whole lot more than they like doing the other part, you know? And frankly, most, I've had one or two students in my years here who really like the theory <laughs> and really don't like to do the programming, but mostly it's the other way around. Everybody likes to do the programming and people kind of like don't like to do the theory. So I just encourage you that as you start your, your study of this stuff, that you, that you realize that there, that there needs to be a balance. And frankly, I think one of the problems in our in, in industry today is that people do not have a good enough grounding in the theory of what they are doing. And, and ultimately, the, the software that they produce suffers from it. So you guys are getting a good, solid foundation from the very beginning here that you should carry on, that should, uh, you should carry on with you throughout your academic and professional uh, careers in computing. Okay, and then there's, uh, here's a required text. There's some things about student learning outcomes. You, I'll let you read about that. Now, the text is A Logical Approach to Discrete Math. Does everybody have this book yet? No. Oh, it's in the mail? Good, okay. Is, is, does the bookstore have them? I mean, are we out? Yeah, there's the used ones. Okay. It looks kind of uh, spooky. If you look at the cover and you see all of this stuff that looks like Greek, it looks kind of intimidating, but don't worry. Um, in fact, we will, this thing that's on the cover, this proof that's on the cover, I can remember, Jason probably remembers this. Um, there will come a day when we actually study this one and you will understand exactly what it means. <laughs> so even though it looks like Greek to you now, not to worry, all right? Uh, so that's the text. I really, uh, uh, a little word about um, tools. I really insist that you get a, that you use a pencil, not a pen. And I insist that you, when you do your, your work, that you do it with lined paper, not just blank paper. Okay, so those two requirements. And it's really, it's really good. You'll, we'll make a lot of mistakes. Have a nice eraser. Okay, <laughs> and so, and that's why uh, pens just don't work very well. And then there's a note here about on your final grade. Oh, actually, let me say a word about how your final grade will be determined. Um, the uh, homework is worth 22%, and each exam is also worth 22%. So what this means is that your homework counts as one whole exam. That's how important it is. All right, so the homework assignments are very, uh, there's, I have a real strict schedule, it's all, everything's all mapped out. And so it's really important that you do your homework and think of it as, do, think of it as doing a take home exam. Because I mean, when you add up all the points, it's worth a whole exam, all right? Like I say, it's all on paper, so um, no problems, no technical problems with having the, you can't say, oh, my computer crashed. I didn't get the homework done. That doesn't work. <laughs> you can say, oh, my head crashed. <laughs> All right. And then attendance. Oh, yeah, now attendance. There's a lot of class participation, and so attendance is really important. The only people who have excused absences are the two people who have already arranged to <laughs> take the course, <laughs> you know, via the video lectures. And on the second page of the syllabus, is the schedule of when the homeworks are due. All right, so 
Um, this is the week of August 30th. The dates on the uh, left-hand column there are the Monday, dates of the Monday of the week. And um, that A1 stands for Assignment 1, and then next Monday we have Labor Day holiday, and then A2 is Assignment 2. So those are the, these are the dates when the, when the assignments are due. Okay, so, and then we'll have two exams, test one, test two, and then a final. All right, so and those are all scheduled out. If you want to put those on your calendar now, you can do that. Um, and as far as when the homework is due, so strictly speaking, the homework is due after class, you know, at the end of class on the day it's due. So when you have, when we have a homework assignment that's due, usually we, there's usually a lot of questions. So, you know, we answer the questions and you can, if, you, if, you have, if you're stuck on something, we can, you know, go over it in class a little bit. And strictly speaking, then at the end of class, that's when they're due. But if you don't get it done by the end of the class, then you have until 5 o'clock on that day to turn it in if you'd like. All right? And my, does everybody know? I don't, some of you have been to my office, but anyway, my office is just right around the corner. It's RAC 112. All right, and I have a box outside my door. You can just put it there, just so long as you get it there before 5. All right? And um, I'm, really, I'm really strict about not having late, not accepting uh, late homework. So if it's late, then it's half credit. And you only have up until the next assignment to get that late assignment in. If it's more than one assignment late, then no credit. Because I don't, you know, it's really, with this material, you can't let it pile up. You know, you can't say, oh, well, I've got three assignments due. And that, well, once it's past one assignment late, it's too late for credit. And you're welcome to turn it in if you want. And if I have time, I might be able to look it over. But it's really to your best advantage to keep up. Because you know what this material is like? It's like learning a foreign language. Well, you guys know math. I mean, you know that once everything builds on what went before, you know, so, you know, you just, if you get behind, then you, it snowballs. And everything depends. Every, everything that we do depends on what went before. And if you don't get what went before, that depends on what went before that, and so on. So that's an incentive for you to not get behind. All right. So uh, our first, uh, as you see on this schedule, our first A1 assignment is due this Thursday. And all of the assignments are on the web page. All right. So here, if you scroll down to assignments, here's, there's a link up here. If you click on A1, that'll take you to the assignment. All right. So we see that this Thursday, September the 2nd, Read lightly chapter zero, study sections 1.1, 1.2, and do exercises 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3. So, you know, if you have your book, it's on page 21. These are the assignments that are due for Thursday. We just turn the exercises, not the study section. Oh, right, right. Yeah, the study stuff, yeah. You're on your own for, for looking at that stuff, yeah. Okay, so, and if you look at this, if you have your book, you look, it's, it's talking about perform the following textual substitutions. And so the first thing that we're going to learn about is how to do textual substitutions formally. All right, and so we'll learn, we, we might actually get to that topic today. If we don't, it'll be, we'll get to it tomorrow in plenty of time for you to do the assignments by Thursday. All right, now I think that's all I have to say about the logistics of the course, are there any questions at all? Is everybody on board? Are you with me? No questions? Everybody knows what's due when and how to get it and all that stuff? All right. All right. Let's start then. Okay, now, the first thing we have to do is, one thing we're going to do in here is a lot of vocab. All right, so the first thing we have to do is do a little vocab. We need to know what is the definition of an expression. We'll going to start with the definition of an expression. Now, everything that I have on the slide is in the book, okay? So you don't really, I, 
what, I, what we do on the board I think is really important for you to get in your notes, but what's up here is really not that important. I mean, it's important. It's not that crucial that you get it in your notes. All right, so now here's the first definition of, uh, the, the, the definition of an expression has four parts, okay? Now, the first part is a constant or a variable is an expression, okay? A constant or a variable is an expression. Now, you guys all know what constants are. A constant is something like a number, like 123. Okay, that's a constant. In algebra, you've used variables in algebra before. You know, like x, 3x plus 4y equals 22. You know, the x and the y, those are variables. All right? Those are letters that can take on values. Okay, so a constant, a, an expression, number one, a constant or a variable is an expression. All right. Now, the second part of an expression is if E is an expression, then parentheses E parentheses is an expression, right? Okay, got that? All right, without looking at your notes or looking at your book, Ashley, what's the first part of an expression? Variable, good deal. And Ben, what's the second part? E is an expression. E is an expression. Good. Okay, good deal. All right. And the third part is uh, describes how a unary operator works. Now, are you guys familiar with unary versus binary operators? What that you know what that means? So a unary obviously uh, unit unit means one. Okay, so a unary operator is an operator that, that operates on one, con on one expression. Okay, it just operates on one expression. And so in the definition here, in our book, our author uses a little round circle in this definition to represent a unary operator. And what the definition says is that if circle is a unary prefix operator and E is an expression, then circle E is an expression, okay? For example, is this an expression, 235? Is it, why? Because it's a what? Because it's a constant, all right? And how about the negative sign? The negative sign is a unary prefix operator. Therefore, negative 235 is an expression. Got that? Okay. So in this case, this negative sign is like uh, it, the circle is the negative sign. What's another unary operator? Does anybody know another unary operator? Actually, ooh, ooh, <laughs> that's a good... Um, yeah, you can consider the square root to be, a, yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but I think that works. I think that works. Any, what, what's another one? Yeah, the plus sign. If you put a plus, yeah, no, plus 235. Yeah, that's, a, that's an expression because plus is a unary operator. Now, one of the unary operators that we're going to learn later is the negation operator. It's a look like this. It'll be a, a unary operator, okay? So, without looking at your book and looking up, what's the first? Let me see. I need to remember names. Kyle. Kyle, what's the first definition? An expression is a variable Constant. And what's the second? Uh, it's an expression. People, all right, and what's the third one? If, if, if circle is a, a prefix, pre prefix unary, unary operator. Op operator. operator. Actually, actually, this is the operand. That's the operator. Operator, operator then, then, oh, and, uh, wait, wait. Uh, it's first of all, and what? An e is an expression. expression then, then uh, the circle E is an expression. Yes, very good. All right. And now the fourth part of the definition is binary. 
infix operators, right? So now, what does, so here, so what is, uh, what does binary mean? What was bi mean? Two, like a biplane has two sets of wings, right? So a binary has two upper, upper ands, and the operator is in between it. So that's an infix binary operator. Is everybody clear on the terminology there? Okay. So now our author uses the symbol star for this part of the definition, right? So if star is a binary infix operator and D and E are expressions, then D star E is an expression. Okay? And here again, I'm sure there are lots of examples that are familiar. Like when you were first learning arithmetic, what is this symbol for? When you're yeah, multiplication, yeah. And what what do you how do you use multiplication? You do something times something else, right? So if you had like two hundred and thirty five times x, well, is two hundred and thirty five an expression? Yeah. Because it's a what? Because it's a constant. And is x an expression? Because it's a variable. And is this a binary infix operator? Yes, so therefore this is an expression. Quick, yeah. On the third definition, what's the little um, squared symbol of the operator? Oh, you know, that's a footnote that he has at the bottom of the page. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry for that. Sorry. Yeah, good, good point. <laughs> yeah, I should have whited that out maybe when I scanned it. I just scanned all these from the book. All right. <laughs> anyway, that is a good question. Not, but now, you, you guys understand how this gets built up. Look. How about, how about uh, 19 minus 23 parentheses um, um, plus 2 times x? Is this an expression? Why is it an expression? Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, because, okay, yeah, you, you, you got to take it, you got to take it. Okay, is, is this an expression? Yes. Why? Because it's a constant. Is this an expression? Yes. Because it's a, and is this an expression? Yes, yes because that's a binary infix operator. Yes. All right, but now, it, because this is an expression, by which part of the definition? First. Yeah, by, then this is an expression. So you guys all see this stuff, right? All right, all right? so are we good to go with? What, what the definition. Now, this all seems kind of like uh, trivial but because we're doing this with algebra and we, you don't normally think of this, but this is going to carry over into a different system because ultimately what we're going to do is we're going, we're going to use these definitions for our formal logic. And logic is going to have, we're going to have lot Boolean expressions. So even though this stuff is kind of a lot of this is review, um, it's going to carry on to, it's going to carry over to stuff that's new. Now, how about this? And how about this from algebra? If you say, if you say 2 times x plus 3. Now, there's two ways to interpret this. You could either interpret this as 2 times x plus 3 like this. In which case, what this means is that first you multiply the 2 times the x, and then after you do that, you add that to the 3. Or you could interpret it like this, 2 times x plus 3. In other words, instead of putting the parentheses around here, you could put the parentheses around here. Are you with me? Now, you learned from algebra, didn't you, that if you write it this way, which one of these work is the top? And why did, how, why did you learn that? How, how did, yeah, that was a rule that you learned. And you learned that rule that if you have two binary inf see here what we have is two binary infix operators next to each other, right? We have this operating on this and then the infix operating on this. And the question is which one do you do first? Okay, now here's the table. This table is on the inside front cover of your book. And when we get to the logic systems, we are going to have to make sure that we and remember what the precedence orders order, orders are, and this um, this table uh, combines the arithmetic operators that you're familiar with, 
with some of the ones that you might not be familiar with yet. So let's just take a look. Here is at, now, now let's, let's take a look at this 2 times x plus 3. Okay, so here, the, here's the plus and here's the times. Are you with me? And because the times is higher precedence, see over here it says the top ones have highest precedence and the bottom ones have lowest precedence. So here's the precedence table. And you're, you're going to have to refer to this until for a while, especially when we do the logic stuff. We'll have to refer to this table to make sure that we understand how to read it, how to use it, so that when we have operators next to each other, we'll know what the precedence is. So if you look up here, then this is the multiply and this is the add. So that, because this is higher, because the multiplier is higher precedence than this, that means that the two multiplies, if you write it like this without parentheses, this means you multiply the 2 times the x first and then you add that to 3. So it's as if the parentheses were here. Are you with me on that? And um, so this is addition, subtraction. Now this is not multiply, this is cross product. You math, I don't know if you guys have had cross products yet in math, but um, we'll get to it. We will use many, many of these we will use in this class. This is the division sign. This is also the division sign. Um, ones that uh, we will use quite a bit is we will use uh, implications and follows from. This is going to be disjunction and conjunction. So we will use a lot of these. You guys recognize these symbols? Really? Some of you? Some of you have some of, have some of you seen these symbols here? These ones here? This little group right here? Yeah, sets. Somebody know what somebody does somebody know what this does somebody know what uh, this means how you say this in subset. Yeah, oh, good. Good shot. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a subset. Yeah, we'll do the we'll do a lot of these. We'll do a lot of these sets and subsets. This is an element of um, this is uh, down. <laughs> down the down operator and the up operator. Actually, <laughs> that was pretty good. This is min and this is max. <laughs> so we'll use min and max in here. And this one we'll use a lot. This dot is, is function application. We'll, we'll, we're going to use that. And one we're going to start using right away is A at the very top of the list. The highest precedence is textual substitution. And that's the topic of your assignment, assignment this due Thursday. So we're going to learn how textual substitution works. But when we do textual substitution, we're going to have to remember that it has a precedence on the precedence chart. And we know how to look it up here on the chart, right? Okay. Is that, are we good? Where are the parentheses on that? Oh, that's a really good question. Ooh, good question. Where are the parentheses? Here's the rule. The rule is that you can put the parentheses around any expression, and when you do that, that automatically changes the precedence and says what goes in the parentheses happens first. Right. So, that's the so it's kind of like, I'm, I'm sorry? Technically parentheses have the highest precedence. Um, yeah, I guess. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, maybe we should put like a, a one above A to be the parens. If you consider parentheses an operator. Yeah. It, oh, that's a good point. And it's not. It's not a Boolean. It's not an, it's neither infix nor prefix. So you answer your own question. Oh boy, this is going to be a great class. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good show. Good show. Good show. Okay. Are we all, is everybody clear on all of this so far? See how easy this stuff is? It's just like this stuff, tell yourself over and over again, this stuff is easy. Because once we get into it, you know, you'll think, ah, oh, but it's all one step at a time. We just, baby steps. Do you guys see What About Bob? Baby steps. You didn't see What About Bob? Oh, you need to Netflix that. <laughs> You know, anyway, since you didn't see it, I won't say anything more about it. All right, so. Um, that, that was Bill yeah, it was Bill Murray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So actually, let's, let's write down what. Um, let's see, I remember names here. Ashley, Ben. Kyle. Rochelle, uh, you must be Josh. Okay, Josh and Mason? Mason, okay. 
Okay, like I said, I'm going to be bad. I'm going to be, I'm bad at names. <laughs> so anyway, um, we can maybe cut that out. You <laughs> can splice that out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so um, parentheses, so let's... Let's jot, that, let's jot down that observation that you just made. Changes the order of precedence. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's parentheses. Now, um, some more vocab. We need to know what the definition of a state is. And uh, this is a really important concept in logic. St and also in computing, by the way. Be, uh, it's very important in computing because what you do in, when you write a program is the system evolves from one state to another state uh, as the program progresses. So what is the definition of state? State is a list a list of variables and their values. Okay, a list of variables and their values. And let me give you an example. Suppose you're dealing with two variables, x and y. An example of a state is parentheses x comma five, close parentheses, open parentheses, y comma 3. This is, here's an example of a state. Okay, so it's a list of variables and their values. Now here's the important thing about state. An expression may be true in some states but not in others. An expression may be true in some states, but not in others. That's a fact. Let me give you an example. What do you think about this? 2x plus 5y equals 7. No, oh. but there, yeah, I bet you can come up with another state that it's not true. Yeah. Well, first of all, by the way, is this an expression? Why is that an expression? Well, is two of is two an expression? Is x an expression? And I, we didn't write it, but what's in between? Binary infix multiply operator, right? And then is five an expression? Is y an expression? Yeah. Is that? Uh, oh, what about this? Is 2x plus 5y an expression? Is 7 an expression? So what's the binary infix operator? Equals. Everybody clear on this? Okay. So it's true in the state. This is true in the state. Let me give you a state. Actually, I'll give you a different state. How about x5, y, negative 1? x5, y negative 1. Is that right? 2 times 5 is 10. Wait. 2x plus 3y equals 7. Oh, it's because I have my notes wrong. I was just kidding. <laughs> now, yeah, sorry. I have an eraser. <laughs> See, you're, you're writing all this stuff in pencil, right? <laughs> See why you need to have <laughs> pencil instead of a pen? <laughs> so, uh, two, yeah, so 2x plus 3y. So if x is 5, 2 times 5 is 10 minus 3 is 7, and that's true. Okay. But not true in the state. But not true in the state. I'll just give a random one here. Uh, 
x1, y2. x1, y2. All right? So everybody understands how state works. All right? Okay. Now, I think... Ha. Good. <clears throat> so, as advertised, we are now going to do textual substitution. All right? Are you ready for this? This is the start of... We will, we will be doing this operation a lot. Now, um, actually, the way I'm going to do it here on the board is different from the way it's done, slightly different from the way it's done in the book. And I would like for you, to, when you do your homework on Thursday, to do it this way. All right? So, here's how it works. It works like this. We have capital E, square bracket, X, and we have this symbol, colon equals, and the way you say this is replaced by, X replaced by R, capital R. Okay, now uh, we're going to start, we, we're going to have some conventions here that are going to be, that are going to be, we're going to use throughout the rest of the year, not just the semester, but the rest of the year. Okay, and the convention is, if it's an uppercase letter, it's an expression, okay? So whenever we have these principles that we learn, like this principle of textual substitution, uppercase letters always represent expressions. Now, what's an expression? First part of an expression is what? Conservative second is? If, if E, if, say that a little more is precise, <laughs> is a precision, then parentheses, E, parentheses, okay, and then if, and then third is if circle is a, is a then, sir, and, and E is an expression, and then circle E, and then star, blah, 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 okay. So this is one of those. Are you with me? This can be a big complex thing with parentheses in it, right? This is, that's this, this E. This R is also one of those. Are you with me? But anytime we have a lowercase letter, that represents a single variable, not an expression. Are you with me? What are variables in Oh, <laughs> that's a good point. All variables are expressions, but there are expressions that are not single variables. So it's kind of like a Venn diagram, you know, subset thing. <laughs> <laughs> are you with me on that? Yeah. So. So, but this, this is specifically, it, it happens to be an expression, but it is, the, but the, the distinguishing thing about it is that it, it has to be a single variable. It can't be an arbitrary expression. Uh, on this side of this, of this replacement operator, on this side of it, this must be a single variable. And I will, I promise you that some people in the future, when we start doing our homeworks, are going to forget this. And there's, it's a common mistake when we get to the symbol manipulations that we'll do in the future to forget that fact. So, so here, let's identify each one of these. Okay, so this one, this one is, now, it's an expression, but this one is kind of like the text. The text to substitute. Okay, that's what this R is. This X, and we will emphasize it here again, is a single or a variable. Actually, we're going to see in a few minutes that it's actually, it's actually okay to have, this is actually represents a list of variables. This could represent a list of variables. But each one of them has to be a single variable, all right? Okay, and then this E is an expression. And you guys have already convinced me that you know what the definition of an expression is, all right? Now, and here now is what 
is how I would like you to do your homework. Let's do a bunch of examples. Oh, actually, before we do the examples, let me explain, let me explain generally how this works. What, you, what, what this is, what this whole thing represents, is the expression, so this is the expression. So right, what this represents is the expression with all occurrences of x the expression with all occurrences of x replaced by with all occurrences of x replaced by now check this out parentheses are parentheses are you with me so what this whole thing represents is this expression because what does this expression have? I mean, it could have a constant or a variable, blah, 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 all that other stuff. So within this thing, there might be some variables. Yeah, maybe not, but maybe yes, right? And if x is one of the variables that's in this expression, then the way you get it, what you get is this expression, and everywhere there's an x, you just like erase it with your eraser, and you stick in parentheses with this whole text, close parentheses. That's what that is. All right. So, and here's how I would like for you to do it. And it's going to seem a little tedious at, at the beginning, and we'll make it, it. We'll be able to skip steps later. But in the beginning, no skipping steps. Okay. So, just a few times. Okay. So check this out. Let's do parentheses x plus y parentheses square bracket x replaced by z plus two square bracket. Okay, and now comes um, a formatting issue. What we're, what we're going to do now is, does everybody understand that this is, is that? And our E is what? X plus Y parentheses. Our variable is this, and that's the text. So here's what I, what I want you to do. You, on the next line in your paper, you outdent, okay, and put equals. And then under this line, you indent and you put an angle bracket like this. Yeah? And here what you write is textual substitution. And then close the angle bracket. Now, it's not going to be obvious why I'm making you do, the, do it this way now. Just trust me that in the future, we're going to do a lot of stuff like this, and this is going to be the standard operating procedure. Okay? So we, I, I just want to see it used to doing it this way. All right? Now, now then, on the third line, what we do is we actually write down what this is according to the rules of textual substitution. So what should I write? Well, I should write this, but everywhere there's an X, I should put a what? Parentheses, Z plus D. So uh, what will it look like? Parentheses, parentheses, Z plus 2, parentheses, plus Y, parentheses. Is everybody... Easy. Isn't this stuff... I mean, it's trivial. Right? It seems trivial. But the way we're doing it, it's going to have implications later on. Right? And now, now we're going to use a little bit of things about what we know from algebra. Now, if you were doing this algebraically, and you, you know, if you were in your college algebra class last year or a couple years ago, whatever, what would you do? How would you write this? You would remove unnecess unnecessary parentheses. Because we have a precedence chart, right? And the precedence chart says that, you know, we can remove on, I mean, so how, so what, which of these parentheses are unnecessary? All of them are unnecessary. You can just do this as z plus 2 plus y, right? And then we're done, and that's, that's this example. So we're going to use the, the, the bracket thing for textual substitution, or the, 
Right. Yeah, this means, yeah. Th I guess I don't understand your question. Sorry, but the, step, the step below it where we add that and, and like narrate what we're doing. Basically. I, yes, this is called. Do that for the next step too? Yes. Yes. Now here's, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm being, trying to be precise this way, even though it seems like it's uh, tedious and unnecessary, is that this, when we, get, when we get to proofs, proof steps, this is going to be a part of the proof process. And what we will actually have in here is we will have theorems. And so I'm trying to get us used to the proof style, right? And every once in a while, we will actually, I mean, when it gets complicated and we're dealing with logic, it'll be helpful for us to keep, you know, to keep this, this style, right? Now, uh, actually, um, there is one other thing that, does it, should the parentheses go around the z plus 2, or should the parentheses go around the 2 plus y? Which one has higher precedence? It's the same. So the question is, does it matter whether the parentheses, does it matter whether you add 2 first, or, and then add that to y, or add the, what law is that? Do you remember that one? Starts with an A. Ferris Bueller. Starts with <laughs> Say it again. Addition? No, no, no. Addition is Associative. 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 That's the associative law. Do you remember the associative law? No? Yes? No? A little scratch board here. Ooh. Yeah. Here. Yeah. It's like, does this look familiar? A plus B parentheses plus C equals A plus parentheses B plus C. I think that's the transitive actually. Or something. Tran oh, yeah, we're going to learn all that stuff. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to remember. Like you can switch them. No, 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 no. That's that's no, no, no. That's commutative. Yeah, we're going to learn all the yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so all that cobwebs are up here. Not quite right. <laughs> all right. I think we have time for one more. And then, okay, so let's do another example. <laughs> yeah, you'll know, you, you will know all of that kind of stuff backward and forward. Okay, how about this? X, X replaced by Z plus 2 equals by Textual substitution, what? Parentheses z, plus two. z plus 2 equals by remove unnecessary paren, what? Z plus 2, okay. Actually, that was so fast, we have time for another one. <coughs> and as we go on and on and on, we abbreviate more and more and more. So how about this? Z plus Y, textual substitution. Now, watch this. Z comma Y. Remember a minute ago I said that, that X can actually represent a list? So here's how, you, here's how we notate that. Z comma Y, textual substitution, Z comma Y, replaced by 5 comma 6. Now, can you imagine what that means? Yeah, the Z is the 5 and the Y, but it's simultaneous. So there's no precedent. Well, it's the, 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 the substitution, it's not sequential. It's, it, it's, this, is gonna, this is a subtle point that will have big implications when, a bit later. But it's a simultaneous substitution. So the way we do this, we say equals by, and let's just go ahead and abbreviate now. Okay. <laughs> you like that? Okay, so what would this be? Parentheses, now what would this be? Parentheses, five. Yeah, now does everybody see that, how the simulta oh, simultaneous work? And then equals by, let's, how about that, gang, huh? Rup, remove unnecessary parentheses, makes it what? Five plus six. And I see by the old clock on the wall, even though we're on a roll here, we're going to have to interrupt so you can get to your next class on time. And see you next time. Tomorrow? And we'll continue this madness then. Right? So you just leave it at 5 plus 6? Yeah.